Now, the other thing that you might want to think about, and this is really useful as far as I'm concerned, is you might want to think about this politically. And we've been doing a lot of work, I'm going to have one of my graduate students actually come and talk to you about the work we've been doing on personality and, pol and political belief. So what happens with political belief is that if you're high in openness and low in conscientiousness, you tend to be a liberal. The openness being the particularly important part of that. And if you're low in openness and high in conscientiousness, especially orderliness, you tend to be a conservative. Now it's kind of strange because openness and conscientiousness aren't very highly correlated. So it's not obvious why those two traits would combine to determine political belief. And, and the relationship is actually quite strong between temperament and political belief if you measure political belief comprehensively. But it seems to me that the fundamental distinction, and this is the political game, at least along the liberal conservative axis, is boils down to one thing. It boils down to how open borders should be compared to how closed they should be. And, you know, you can see that reflected, for example, in the attractiveness of Trump to a large part of the general population because he's going to close the borders, build a wall, and fortify the borders. And conservatives like that. They like to have borders between things stay tight. And they don't even care if it's state borders, or political borders, or town borders, or ethnic borders, or borders between ideas, or borders between sexual identities. Conservatives like to have things stay in the damn box where they belong. Partly because they're orderly, and partly because they're low in openness, they don't get any real... They're not interested in what happens if you free up your conceptions. All they see in that is the pro probability of disorder. Whereas liberals, who are high in openness and low in conscientiousness slash orderliness, they get a real charge out of letting things out of the box so that they can creatively interplay. Now, the issue is, who's correct? And the answer is, you don't know because the environment underneath the political landscape moves. And so sometimes the right answer is tighten up the borders and fortify. And sometimes the right answer is no, 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 loosen things up because everything's getting too static and tight and we need more information. And the dialogue that occurs in the political landscape, this is why dialogue is so important, is fundamentally between these two opposing views of borders. And because you can't say with certainty which one is right at any given time, an open dialogue has to maintain itself so that the entire political state can maneuver properly along that moving line. It's absolutely crucial. It's really, really, really useful to know that people vote their damn temperament. It, gets you, it gives you more of an understanding, at least in principle, of, your, of those who sit on the other side of you on the political fence. And there's been recent newspaper articles, quite interesting. I tweeted a couple of them about this company and UK called Cambridge Analytics and they're using the damn big five they can extract out big five information from your Facebook likes they've got a model of every single person in the United States big five personality and they help Trump craft political messages right down to the level of apartment buildings to appeal to people based on their big five temperament and that's all recent work and so one of the things that's very interesting is we are teaching computers to understand us so fast you can't believe it. And we really do risk walking into an electronic world where you will only see what you want to see. I mean, obviously the marketers are trying to do that as, as fast as possible, right? They only want to send you ads that you're going to be interested in because it's expensive and foolish to send you anything that will annoy you or that you'll ignore. And so the marketers are trying like mad to map who you are even by watching your eyes. They're, they're trying to figure out who you are so they can send you the right information, but the danger is that that'll happen, say, in the domain of news and broader information, increasing this tendency for people to be siloed in their exposure to the external world. It's a big, pro it's sort of like each of us is becoming a micro-celebrity surrounded by electronic sycophants who do nothing but tell us exactly what we want to hear. It's a real problem. Karl Popper, a famous philosopher of science, said that one of the things that you should do, and this is akin to the Piagetian view, is you should always look for information that contradicts your current viewpoint. Now that's painful, right? Because who wants their axioms contradicted? It can take you apart. But it's the only way that you can ensure that you're learning at the same time that you're maintaining your stability. And that's another reason why it's really necessary to engage in dialogue with people that you do not agree with. Because they're the ones who will tell you things that you don't know. It's, cru it's of crucial importance in the maintenance of your own stability. The worst thing that can happen to a person, no, because there's many horrible things that can happen to a person, but one of the worst things that can happen is that you find yourself in a situation where no one is offering you corrective feedback anymore. 
because you rely on the corrective feedback provided by other people to keep yourself sane, to keep moving in the ever-changing environment. And if you cut yourself off from that feedback, then, well, then you end up static and shrinking. It's really, it's really not good. You get less and less competent, you get less and less confident, and the threats outside of you loom larger and larger.